Hello everyone, I'm Andy Davo and this is the video I've been looking forward to making the most. This is my guide to Dark Elves in Blood Bowl 3. This video I'm going to cover six key topics for you. Uh, the first is I'm going to introduce the players and make up the team and how they actually work. Then we're going to look at how to level those players to get the most out of them. Then I'll talk to you a little bit about starting team builds and how to make that whole team work as a cohesive unit. And that leads into the overall strategy of Dark Elves and how we play them. Uh, then I'm going to cover off the offensive and specifically defensive setups with Dark Elves, uh, again, to make them the most effective on the pitch. And then finally, I'm going to cover off inducements and what you should be looking out for and how you should uh, take the inducements to get the most out of the team. Now, I was thinking about this, why Dark Elves? Why are they some of my favourite team in all of Blood Bowl? And I was able to boil it down to four key points, I think. Number one, they've got one of the best players in the game. The Witch Elf, which is uh, in the picture there, the second from the left. She is arguably and normally in a lot of polls, normally in one of the top three positionals in the whole game. So they've got one of the best players. Uh, they can then do some of the best plays in the whole game. Uh, crowd surfing is probably something I'm uh, quite known, well known for and quite addicted to it. With Frenzy and with this team, you can do a lot of crowd surfing, so they look cool. Um, they can also run away with matches in terms of running up a large amount of touchdowns, so uh, that they also uh, do well for me there. And then finally, while they are an elf team and have all the extra ability to do elf nonsense, they can also fight a little bit because they've got armor nine, uh, sorry, armor nine plus uh, across the board, apart from uh, a couple of positionals, and they can have a bit of a fight. So for me, they've got a little bit of everything. With that in mind, let's go and have a look at the team uh, and introduce the players properly. Right, so let's have a quick look at all the different positionals. Uh, on the Dark Elf team, we have five different players. Um, we're going to start with the best player on the team, which is the Witch Elf. We're allowed to take up to two of those. However, as you can see in the top right here, they are quite expensive. And normally starting Dark Elf rosters either run with none or one of them because of their cost. Uh, she's movement seven, she's strength three. She can dodge on a 2+, plus. she can't throw the ball, but never mind. Uh, and she's a little bit fragile, uh, at only AB 8+, plus, so you need to look after her. However, she does start with three really good skills. Uh, one is a core skill here, which is dodge. We've got frenzy, which we will lean into in just a moment. And then also, if she does get knocked over, she can jump up for free, and then still have all seven squares of movement, as long as she's not stunned. Uh, from the skill trees, we've got general. Um, sorry, primary skills are general and agility. Uh, but she does also have access to strength uh, and passing skills uh, overall. Um, now, first of all, how would you build this player? I think there are two different normal career paths that you want to go down. Uh, we've got the ball sacker to go and fetch the ball. Now that would be things like uh, in the general tree here, we'll just jump into this. You want to be looking at wrestle, you want to be looking at tackle, you want to be looking at strip ball. Uh, where's that one? There it is. Uh, and in honestly, if you had a wrestle, tackle, strip ball, which elf, she would be an absolute menace to a lot of players. Um, you could look to try and lean into that a little bit further uh, with Leap, although unfortunately Leap has had a little bit of a nerf in this rule set. Um, but I think Wrestle Tackle uh, Strip is a very strong player. There is also, because she's got Frenzy, uh, the Killer Slash Surfing positional. Um, and at that point, I think you'd be looking to take Block as their first, as, as her first skill, then Tackle. So again, very similar career path. But this is where it then diverges and we jump into the strength tree and we look at juggernaut which means that when you roll a both down you now get to choose that as a pushback it also helps pushing back stand firm players so now the side sidelines just aren't safe and then if you also want to build her into some sort of killer uh, then the mighty blow skill here uh, which is mighty blow plus one is also a very worthy um, candidate uh, they are the two career paths and i think normally you want to take one of each before you jump into one of those two career paths it's worth looking here at the characteristic. Um, she's already a really fast player. She's also very agile. She's going to do potentially a fair chunk of the blitzing, which means that any of these top three statistics up here are very good for you. So movement allowance just lets you cover both sidelines a bit more. I'd take that. Strength, brilliant for punching things in the face. So take that. Uh, and agility then lets her lean even harder into the uh, ball sack, ball hawk type route. So. Typically, what people will do with the Witch Elves is they probably will take one with Block or Wrestle and then they'll be saving up their star player points uh, if they can, if it's over a long format league, and take a characteristic. For me personally, if I could choose, I would actually take Agility, um, not Strength, because Agility 5 Witch Elves were insane in Blood Bowl 2 uh, 
And if you were ever crazy enough to get an Agility 6 Witch Elf, uh, they were a thing of beauty. So uh, that's that for me is Witch Elves. Um, and just to sum up, I think, try and build one of each. Uh, a Killer uh, and a Ball Sacker. Next, let's, let's look at the Blitzes. Uh, the Blitzes are allowed up to four on. Uh, they are the staple and the core of the team. They also have a, a cost of 100,000, so they are reasonably expensive again uh, without being prohibitive. Um, you really do want to try and get all four of these into a starting team as possible, or you want to try and get all four of these uh, onto the team as quickly as possible if you didn't start with all four. They start with a block skill, and really there is absolutely no substitute for taking their first skill at six star player points, which is dodge. That gives you a block dodge, movement seven, uh, AV9 plus player, who at low team value is an absolute menace. Again, one of the better players in the game uh, because he can also dodge on two plus. Now, at this point, you then got to think about how you would then build them after you've taken dodge. Dodge really, really, really should be your first skill, no matter what, and then you move into other things. So sideline control, if you're gonna go that route, it seems to make a lot of sense, and therefore dodge, leaning into sidestep, gives you more control, and then you could potentially go into uh, a strength skill, and take guard that gives you block dodge sidestep guard awful lot of control uh, and is an absolute menace if you want to go even further into the site uh, the the control route go back into the general three and let's look at fend that's a great skill uh, and we've also got uh, in the agility tree diving tackle uh, which is there and that skill if you take uh, block dodge sidestep diving tackle tackle uh, you put that on a cage on a ball carrier they're going to have to blitz you because they're not dodging away. So, um, diving tackle, tackle, sidestep, guard, absolutely all great skills, fend, um, but just make sure you've taken dodge before you do anything else, take dodge. Sometimes people will build a uh, an out and out try and sort of a killer uh, with a blitzer because they've already started with block and they don't want to use the witch elves. That's fine. Again, take dodge to start. Then I think you should take tackle so you've got something that can reliably knock stuff over. And at that point, you're then probably jumping back in here. Uh, and as the same with the Witch Elf, we're then taking Mighty Blow. So you've got block, dodge, tackle, Mighty Blow as a player. Just covering off uh, statistic characteristics. Again, I think the Blitzes are prime for taking any form of characteristic. Click into the characteristics tree. Any of those three are great. Do try and avoid armor value uh, and absolute, absolutely avoid the passing skill uh, as it's terrible. So take those three. Any of those are great. Just make sure you don't take every blitzer with an increase in movement because all this, the stats do synergize, but don't go overboard. You do need core skills to make. Let's do the Assassin next. It's the next on the list. The Assassin is, I think, probably a unique player within Blood Bowl 3 uh, as it's the only player uh, on, on the rostered team that can get this skill, which is Stab. Now, Stabbing replaces, if you wish, your block or blitz action, and it allows you to just roll uh, against your opponent's armor roll. If you break your opponent's armor by stabbing them, you then cause an injury as normal, you roll against that as well. Um, now the downside to this is if you don't break the opponent's armor, then you'll be stood next to your opponent, who then probably is gonna punch you in the face. And if we quickly look at the stat line of this player, you'll notice it's AV8+, and it doesn't have block, it doesn't have dodge, so the chances are you're gonna leave the pitch. So stab is a great skill against low armor players who are low strength, but it's not so good against things like orcs, dwarves, um, chaos, that sort of stuff. Uh, so be careful when you use the stab skill, but it can be quite good. We also have shadowing skill, um, and shadowing when it's now movement seven, he's a reasonable player. Um, and so some people will now start to take the assassins because they are uh, movement seven. If you are gonna take that, I think the first skills you need to take are block and dodge for defense because the player is so fragile. And then after that, there's a really only other one skill that you want to be taking, uh, which is not in the list right now. Uh, it will be in the list. It must be switched off because the game is still fairly new, and that's multiple block. Uh, multiple block lets you stab not one, but two players, um, ignoring their strength because it's a stab action, and that is definitely a very strong skill. So if you're going to roster an assassin, you're going to level him up. Block, dodge, um, multi-block. Um, from a characteristics point of view, movement allowance goes really well with your shadowing, so if you do want to do that, I take movement. I wouldn't take strength and I wouldn't really take agility. I certainly wouldn't take agility. Um, strength makes him a weird pseudo blitzer. Um, and then uh, passing, no. There is an argument for taking armor value here because armor 7 up to armor 8 might add a little bit more survivability. 
um, with um, claw not going to be quite as prevalent in this rule set, um, then you could argue that potentially armor value in some leagues and in some situations might be of limited value. Um, I would avoid randoming skills on this player. So all three players so far we've covered, don't random skills on them. As they've got all defined roles and you really need to take the skills um, that, that I'm laying out really. Next, the runner. So most elf teams have a thrower. Uh, the dark elves build their entire playstyle about running with the ball uh, and then potentially handing off. So this player fits into that. Uh, again, it's at movement seven. So you see here dark elves are quite a fast roster overall. Basic normal movement on teams is six. And a lot of players are actually five as well. So, um, so far we've picked everything that's got movement seven. It's strength three, it's agility two plus. Uh, it can pass the ball on a three plus. Disappointing uh, that it can't pass the ball on a two plus. Um, but we can fix that in just a second. And uh, again, it is quite a squidgy player with only armor eight value, armor value eight plus. The, the role of this player is to throw the ball and carry it and pick it up. So skills like block and dodge for defense, absolutely core. Sure hands, great uh, skill to stop strip ball. It also means that you don't waste a reroll on picking the ball up. So that's your first three. And then we can go and look at the passing tree. Um, so I think accurate and I think pass are probably the skills that I would round it out. That takes you to 76 star player points. Um, so pass, accurate, block, dodge, sure hands. If you have one of those, it's an amazing player. However, the runner also starts, if we go back to the overview screen, starts with this skill here, which is dump off. And dump off, when blitzed, means that the opponent, when they're blitzing, before they've even got to your player, you can dump off the ball. So you could actually not take some of the defensive skills and you could lean straight into the passing skills. So you could take accurate, you could take pass, um, and you could also look at nerves of steel. So you can now guarantee to pass the ball on a two plus to somebody else. Now, your player's going to get whacked and he's got no defensive skills. So it, it comes at a cost. However, if you want to offload that ball, um, then by all means, you can take those skills and you're probably going to still hold the ball. If you were feeling really, really sort of fruity, we jump back into the blitzer tree and we can go into here um, and we could, if you really wanted to, you could put catch on a blitzer uh, to give you that dump off catch ability. I don't think it's a good idea, but if you really want to lean into that craziness, uh, then that is there. Catch is just a substandard skill on Dark Elves, but if you want to go the crazy route, then I'm not, not going to rule it out. Uh, next, I'm going to cover off the Dark Elf linemen, and the Dark Elf linemen are there to fill in the roles that the other players haven't quite gotten around to yet, or just to take the hits while your, your positionals actually do all the hard work. Um, it's still a really good player in its own right. It's movement six, it's average. It's strength three, it's average. It's agility two, that's well above average. Uh, it could potentially pass the ball in a pinch, although I wouldn't advise it. Uh, and it's AV9 plus. It hasn't got any skills, so it's a blank slate. And at this point, I think you can argue that because there are so many quite good you know, good skills in here, then randoming a couple of skills on these players really can uh, help you. So wrestle, yeah, it's fine. You could take that. Tackle, yep, yeah, sure. Pro, it's okay. Shadowing's not great, but it's not terrible. Strip ball, again, not great, but not terrible. Kick, you absolutely need one of those. Dirty player, you absolutely need one of those. So there's three skills that you really do want probably even four. Frenzy, not so much. Dauntless, yeah, okay, it's five. Block, six. And Fend, yeah, there's, there's like half the skills in there. You'd be quite delighted if you got one. Um, and there's another three or four that are okay. So I would recommend that the first couple of Dark Elf linemen that level, just run them all the skills and see what you get because it makes a big difference to your team value. And team value on Dark Elves is super important to keep under control. Overall roles, what do you actually need? We need a sneaky get dirty player lineman. We need um, some wrestle linemen to control the line of scrimmage and we probably want a couple of block dodge linemen to be able to just move around and act as pseudo blitzers. You do also want a kick player really early on so that you can control the ball and we can lean into the strategy which I'll talk about slightly later in the video um, and from a characteristics point of view just to round out the leveling process just avoid them. There are, there are so many more skills that you do want that are on general uh, which would be fine. Um, one last skill which I do want to cover uh, and make a specific note of his guard. Once you've got some players with either block or dodge or wrestle, do consider saving up and picking up guard. Guard on Dark Elves is amazing. And once you can get to three, four, five guard, then Dark Elves can mix it with even the best of the fighter teams, um, even if it is just for a short period of time. So save up for guard. And I think Dark Elves, while not an initially super strong starting team, 
uh, really do come into their own between the sort of team value range of about 1400 and 1800 uh, where you can start stacking block dodge guard uh, on a lot of players so yeah that's uh, that's all the players and that's how to level them let's go and have a look at some rosters okay so looking at rosters i'm going to put together three rosters for you um, they all unfortunately are pinned around the two reroll mechanic because dark elves are so expensive uh, ideally you're looking to try and get to three rerolls as quickly as possible um, you also want an apothecary and probably a 12th player uh, all of those fairly early on the shopping list now this roster is probably more akin to maybe a tournament play uh, or if you're a confident player that you think you can win some games or at least score some touchdowns to generate some cash uh, we've gone for one witch elf i've gone for three blitzers linemen to 11 and we only are using the one dedicated fan we start with it does therefore not generate very much money and picking that third reroll up is going to be problematic um, however it does give you the best chance of winning the early games so if you're in a ladder type format this is not a bad roster to go with where winning games is probably more important than generating extra cash next roster we're going to look at is this one here um, this roster has an extra dedicated fan and we've got four blitzers uh, and linemen to 11 again i've only got two re-rolls you'll notice this is slightly cheaper because uh, the dedicated fans don't add to your team value not enough to probably make you get inducement money but it is uh, reasonable now one of the things i like about this roster over the last one is that everybody is armor nine plus so your chance of taking a player death early on uh, is reduced um, it's also a very simple roster to play because everyone's either movement six or movement seven um, and you've got four blitzers early on if you were going to play this roster do try and put points on the blitzers so you've got a one or two dodge pieces that will give you a bit more reliability and the first thing i would try and buy here is an apothecary then leading into a reroll. Uh, the final roster is this one uh, which is a variant of the same roster uh, and what i've actually been able to do is i've downgraded the blitzer to a lineman and that has given me 30k back and i've dumped that 30k into the dedicated fans pool this is probably um, a roster for people who think they're either going to lose players early on or they're not confident they can score touchdowns so that they've still got some money coming in so if they have players that die they can go with this um, it's not a roster i'm personally looking to play a lot um, as i would hope i can you know pick out some early results but if you are concerned that early player deaths are going to cause you a problem then this is probably the roster also note that team value 1960 means you might pick up an inducement or two like a babe or something else like that which might help you uh, later on so this roster while definitely not the strongest does have a niche and that's why i wanted to include it right now time for the strategy section everyone uh, this is probably my favorite bit to talk about in all of blood bowl um, and we're going to start off with offensive um, setups so uh, an offensive setup really is difficult to actually pin out because it massively depends on what your opponent's doing and it also depends on what turn it is but let's just assume for a second that our opponent's put three players on the line of scrimmage right in the middle here and then it's turn one if those two things are true then i've put three of the blitzes on the line here we'll block diagonally from number four to just this square here three to blocks in front of the two player this blocks here that means your opening three blocks are with block and it also means that uh, if you don't get a knockdown maybe 10 and 11 can throw hits i've done chevrons here to try and protect our flanks uh, because during a blitz in blood bowl three your opponent cannot use team rerolls and cannot use the dodge skill so uh, we've got that i've got a safety which is unfortunately a lineman and then i'm going to carry the ball on the witch elf uh, early doors you can swap nine and one around if you want to carry the ball on a lineman and keep the witch elf free hugely depends on what put what team you're playing against and your general confidence level um, but I think this is a very safe and secure offense. Now let's look at defensive setups. Um, now this is where the defensive setups for me get a little bit funky and are hugely uh, opponent dependent. Um, so first of all, uh, what am I doing? Number one, I'm offsetting the line of scrimmage. The reason I'm offsetting the line of scrimmage is because from here all the way across to here, that gives me a big nice wide gap to run into to pressure our opponent. At that point, I'm probably kicking the ball up in this top right hand corner up here if the board uh, existed and went up a bit further and that means that uh, six of my players uh, can potentially get around there uh, I've also put the witch elf in the middle on this setup so that we've got frenzy at threat on both sides uh, against our opponent and that might mean that they set up slightly narrower uh, in case you get a blitz um, and then I've put linemen on this side because I'm not really actually looking to threaten the left but by putting some people there your opponent's setup will uh, cover these players from running into your opponent's half. Uh, ideally, one of these players has a kick, 
Uh, so we have got enough space for up lineman to stand in the middle here, which is number six. And again, using the kick skill, which I hope you've picked up, uh, we can kick deep into a corner to run through. This is a balanced setup. Um, this is probably more in tins uh, of defending a two or a three turn lead. Uh, or if you've just got a fresh team and you don't really have any control skills yet, uh, this setup's fine. It's absolutely balanced. There's nothing wrong with it. And it's just boring chevrons. Uh, I put the witch elf to one side. Does mean, unfortunately, we don't get to threaten this side of the field with Frenzy in turn one. But if you have got two blitzes, uh, witch elf, sorry, then they would go in the one and two squares. Um, this is great if your opponent's got Frenzy. If they don't, then we can just step these players forwards because it helps defend them. And now we know that three and four are getting blitzed. Well, if we think those are going to get blitzed, we can swap that round. So now your opponent is blitzing a lineman on turn one. We don't really care about that. Uh, it also means our blitzes are a little bit further forward uh, on, on the right and left flank. Then I've got this side, um, which is Frenzy both sides. We put the Witch Elf in the center again. Um, and again, I'm able to threaten uh, both sides. Um, this is if they've got Frenzy. This is if they don't have Frenzy. And again, the idea is that we kick into a corner and we rush after it. Now, that then leads into what on earth is the Dark Elf strategy and what are we trying to achieve? So I think the Dark Elf strategy can be broken down into several key points. I think it's three. Number one, we kick into a corner and we chase after it. If it's turn one, we just go and kick and rush. And I would play a very aggressive line because the best way to break a cage is to stop it even forming. Um, if that fails and the opponent does get into a cage and it's no later than turn three, then you can keep pressuring the ball and it doesn't matter about positioning too much. Once the turns get to turns four and five, you then really aren't talking about pushing your opponent into the end zone or turning them over. You really want to stop the touchdown. And at this point, you want to start bringing your players goal side so you've got 11 players behind the ball. The best way you can then control the opponent is if you can control these center squares here with the Dark Elves, you force your opponent to go down a sideline. And at that point, the Witch Elf comes into play because with Frenzy, not only your opponent now attacking down a nar narrow corridor, you've also got to be very mindful that the Witch Elf doesn't push off one of their opponent, uh, one of their players, um, and that then limits their ability to control the side even further. So that's that's general strategy. Um, let's round up the uh, the guide with looking at inducements. So I'll see you in a sec for inducements. Hello everyone, and welcome to the inducement section of this guide. This is the final section of the guide, um, and we'll be talking about what you can do to try and tip the balance of power in your favour if you're playing from behind in terms of team value. This guide will look at the inducements in two sections. We've got basic inducements and then we have star players. Uh, on the basic inducements section, there are two star two things that really stand out, uh, which are sort of S tier, and they are the wizard uh, and the bribe. First of all, we'll cover the wizard. That allows you to do a fireball attack or uh, a single target zap spell. Now, I think you want to be looking at a fireball and I think you want to be looking at a fireball where you're trying to target a minimum of four players to get the maximum value out of it. The fireball should mean your opponent uh, plays a slightly looser cage. And if they're playing a slightly looser cage, that will give you some space and uh, position to work with. And of course, if they don't, then that gives you a area effect, mighty blow hit uh, on a once per game. Wizard still very strong, just slightly let tuned down from the overpowered nature that they were in Blood Bowl 2. Uh, the other thing that stood out here for me, of course, is the bribe. And the bribes, although they are 100k, if you have leveled a sneaky git or sneaky git dirty player ideally, then you can synergize that with the bribe and your ability to remove players now uh, is incredibly strong. If you can remove players at the same rate you're losing players, then your team is probably one of the best in the game. Uh, and sort of eight versus eight, if you're Dark Elves versus almost anything else, you're actually ahead because your players are so good. So do consider a bribe if you've only got 100k or as a part of a larger package, uh, if you do have a sneaky get dirty player. Now, if we look at the star players, there are two star players in this list of six that are terrible, uh, and I think you should just avoid almost entirely. This is the first one, Asper and Thorn. It's a, basically, it's a thrower. If you're playing from behind in team value, the fact that you need, you know, need a thrower should not be the reason that you're behind. So do not take this player. Uh, and the other player I would strongly avoid, avoid uh, is this one here, because looking at the skills, we've got foul appearance, which is meh, We've got on the ball, which is meh. We've got tackle, which is, while useful, probably not the reason to take this player. We've got tentacles, but it's strength three, so tentacles is rubbish. Uh, and we've got disturbing presence, which unless you really need to disturb someone's presence, don't take it. So those two players are rubbish. Um, with that in mind, then, we've actually got four to pick from. I'll go through them in the order of cost. 
First of all, Helmet Wolf. Helmet is pretty good against some high value targets. Once they put the once per game uh, skills in, Helmet Wolf will be pretty good because he's got pro um, and he'll also uh, be able to sort of hack down more than one player. So he's pretty good. Is he better than a wizard? I don't think so. But he's not terrible. Yeah, he's not an insta pick, but he's he's okay. He's sort of B tier. Then we've got Eldril Sidewinder, who is absolutely top end A tier. And when you combine that with a wizard or just combine that with your blitz, you've got potential of being able to get at the ball, even if it's inside a cage, because he's got this skill here, which is Hypnotic Gaze. Hypnotic Gaze lets you just switch off a player for a turn, and therefore you can walk past it, which means you should be able to just blitz the ball. Uh, Eldril has been a match winner in previous games, uh, previous matches for me, so absolutely consider taking him. And if you can afford him, he might well be first pick. Then we got Roxana Darknail. I said earlier in the video, Witch Elves were great. Just imagine having a Witch Elf that's even better than great. Uh, she has Agility 1 plus, so actually she's Edge 5 in old money. Um, she's got Frenzy skill, which is great, but she's also got the Juggernaut skill. So when she's blitzing, she's not likely to turn over anywhere near as much uh, as she is without block. She doesn't unfortunately have block or wrestle. Um, she has got jump up like a normal witch. She's also got leap, which is okay. Um, sadly, she's got loner, so she's a little bit unreliable. And for me, therefore, she's not S tier. She's just an A tier player. Now, if you have got an obscene amount of money to spend, then you could shoot. Yeah, you could take one of the best star players in the whole game. Um, Games Workshop have recently come out and published um, a mega star list. And on that mega star list, Morgan Ford is on there. He's on there because he's strength six. He's Edge 3+, plus, which is meh, but he's movement 6, he's armor value 11+, plus, and he has block, but he has this skill here, Mighty Blow plus 2. Mighty Blow plus 2 on a 2d6 distribution curve absolutely breaks the distribution, and he is game-breakingly strong. Uh, if you have got the ability to take more, probably, he is probably the player you take, and then you build the rest of the inducement package around it. Thankfully, he's very expensive, and hopefully he won't see much play, but when you see him, he is very, very strong. So, now, thank you very much for watching the guide video. I hope the whole thing was really useful. Uh, if you've got any comments, please leave them in the comment section below. It supports the YouTube algorithm an awful lot uh, if people do like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Uh, and it doesn't cost anyone uh, uh, any money, so uh, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. If you enjoy the comments, uh, sorry, enjoy the videos, also tell me what you'd like to see in future videos. I can put that in. And if you would like to see me play Dark Elves, then I do have a Twitch channel um, and it's on the rest of this YouTube channel. Come and tune in. The links will be in the description below. Uh, so until next time, thank you very much for watching. I've been Andy Devo. You've been great. See you soon. Thank you.